This presentation is going to examine the links between health and climate change and air pollution. Climate change has been described as the greatest threat to global health. And in this presentation, we're going to examine some of the reasons behind that statement. So firstly, to set the scene, global, mean global temperatures are rising. This is unprecedented. Burning fossil fuels is the key driver for anthropogenic climate change. We're witnessing the highest temperatures that we've seen on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years. Increasing greenhouse gas emissions is leading to this rise in mean global temperatures and other changes to the climate. The anthropogenic effects on planetary health include also the loss of biodiversity, ocean acidification and desertification. How does this impact on health? Over the next few slides, we'll look at some of those causes and some of those linkages. So firstly, to take a step back, when we think about what influences our health, what affects our health, we have to think really broadly. Our health is not just about healthcare. In fact, various pieces of research have concluded that healthcare actually only pays a fairly small part in our health and health outcomes. The King's Fund in 2018 came up with this model using four spheres or four pillars that work together and all interact to affect population health. One of the major influences on health is from the wider determinants of health. And in the next slide, we'll look at that in more detail. Where we live, our social capital, the environments that we live in, these have really important impacts and effects on both our physical and mental health. So this slide is a modification of the very well used and well recognized Dahlgren and Whitehead uh, model of the wider determinants of health. This more recent version by Barton and Grant has inserted a layer over the top called the global ecosystem. Right at the center of this, you can see people and people's health. The center of people is not modifiable. We can't modify our age, our biological sex. However, all of the arcs and layers over this are modifiable, both in positive and negative ways on our health. What we can see from this is over the top of everything, climate stability will have an impact on all of these other layers, including the natural environment, the built environment, the activities that people take part in underneath this. This has an effect on economy, incomes, communities, lifestyle, etc. So this model helps us to think about how climate change might impact in both positive and negative ways on the health of people through all of these mediating factors. Climate change is leading to changes in the hydrological system. This leads to flooding, changes to rainfall seasonality. These two images help us to think about how climate change is affecting population health. This is a photo from flooding in Pakistan. You can see the damage to infrastructure, the vulnerability of children in these settings. The other picture on the right is from the very recent floods this year in 2023 in Libya, which were catastrophic. All of these situations, we need to think about population vulnerability, infrastructure, damage to housing, damage to roads, damage to healthcare uh, infrastructure itself as well. Thinking about preparedness, community resilience is also important when considering the impacts that disasters like this will have on health. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of drought and wildfires. On the left, this is from a high income country. This is in Southern California, where there's a firefighter tackling a wildfire. Wildfires in high income countries typically have from an acute point of view, have fairly low mortality in terms of the health impact. However, the morbidity usually relating to air pollution resulting from the particle, particulate matter resulting from the fire, 
but also that loss of infrastructure again, that loss of housing, huge psychological impacts as well for people, absolutely enormous impacts on people's health long term in terms of that loss of income, that loss of infrastructure, possessions, housing, etc. On the right, this is a farmer surveying his field that used to be a wheat field. This is in Afghanistan in a low income setting. And again, you can see the impact on health here, loss of livelihood, loss of income, that will have enormous effects on his health, his family's health, community health, etc. Now thinking about air pollution, the reason to talk about air pollution when we're considering climate change is several fold. The drivers that drive air pollution are very, very similar to the drivers that drive climate change. So it's crucial that we think of the two together. Air pollution has been described as the greatest environmental risk factor for health. It is estimated to cause around 7 million deaths per year globally. And in the UK, the estimates are around 40,000 deaths per year. In the UK, it's estimated from an attributable risk that around one in 20 deaths can be attributed to air pollution. So in 2019, air pollution contributed to around 6.67 million deaths worldwide. What's important with air pollution, we had previously thought of it and considered it from a health point of view in terms of its respiratory effects. There is increasing body of evidence that this has effects on cardiovascular health and also on dementia, on breast cancer and type 2 diabetes. The evidence is widening and increasing on its effects from a, a neurological point of view, from a point of view of cognitive deficit for the unborn fetus. So all the time, this idea of air pollution affecting people throughout this whole life course is accumulating. And with it, the urgency that we tackle air pollution. It's the fourth leading risk factor for early death in 2019, surpassed only by high blood pressure, tobacco use and poor diet. Burning fossil fuels drives both air pollution and climate change. Action to tackle climate change is also likely to improve air quality and therefore bring benefits to population health. One of the most obvious manifestations of climate change is an increasing severity and frequency of heat waves. In Northern Europe in 2003, the heat wave resulted in a public health emergency. Approximately 15,000 excess deaths were witnessed in France during that period of extreme heat in August 2003. What's important about this is that this really illustrated this complex interaction between social and biological vulnerabilities. The biological vulnerabilities are around an ageing population, uh, people with uh, pre-existing conditions such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. They may be on drugs that affect their ability to thermoregulate and therefore make them much more vulnerable and susceptible to heat stroke. However, it also illustrated this important association with social vulnerabilities. People who are isolated, who aren't um, linked in with the community, and have other conditions that make them much more vulnerable. This event in 2003 increased the recognition of the risk that heat waves present to public health and was a real wake up call for high income countries in Europe to consider heat waves as important uh, events that need, uh, where the population needs to be protected. Resulting from this, the UK developed its heat wave plan which was similar to the previous cold weather plans that have been in place for years in the NHS. Heat waves like this have an acute effect on health. However, thinking about the long term effects of increasing exposure to heat, we need to also think about its effect on economic productivity, particularly for manual workers, for agricultural workers 
And this has consequent impacts on countries' GDP and individual health as well. Central America in the 1990s, large numbers of agricultural workers were dying from kidney disease. And these were people without the classic risk factors of hypertension or type 2 diabetes and generally tended to be younger workers. Because of the poor access to healthcare and the economic and financial status of these workers working in the sugarcane plantations, it was difficult initially to establish the etiology of this. What has become slightly clearer is that this does seem to be a new type of nephropathy. It's been described as chronic kidney disease of unknown origin or CKDU. The precise cause is still not clear, but it does appear in part to be due to exposure to extreme heat. Also possibly exposure to agricultural chemicals. This is a classic example of a newly emerging heat sensitive condition. When we look at heat wave exposure, this is from the Lancet from 2020. This has looked at various regions of the world and various countries of the world over a 40 year period. And this shows really dramatically how heat wave exposure to populations in terms of millions of people has increased enormously over the last 20 years or so. This has impacts on economic productivity, it has impacts on demand for healthcare and the health status of populations as well. So when we're thinking, that's just one example of impacts on healthcare. So when we're thinking very generally on what are the health impacts of climate change, we can use this model, which was developed by Anthony McMichael uh, back in 2013. This divides these into primary, secondary and tertiary. There are pri direct biological consequences of heat waves, for example and extreme weather events such as flooding, there could be immediate direct loss of life from drowning. However, the point of this model is to say that thinking about the secondary and tertiary, i.e. the more distal and less proximal effects, are equally, if not probably, more important in terms of the scale of the impact. These risks that are mediated by changes, for example, in um, food yields from an agricultural point of view, these will have impacts on the affordability of the food as the price goes up and can then have impacts on the nutritional status of populations. The tertiary effects can be things like if agricultural land becomes too difficult to farm and the crop yields are going down because of lack of water, drought, heat waves, etc., then populations will tend to move, tend to migrate. That can lead to conflict because of conflict and competition over limited resources. So that in itself will have an impact on health and certainly have an impact on mental health as well. This is another model that the Lancet produced a few years ago. What's nice about this is it looks at other aspects of uh, planetary health. So not just about increasing temperatures, but looking at ocean acidification, biodiversity, etc. And again, this is a really nice way of looking at those impacts, how they interact with some of the social mediators as well to ultimately impact on health. And this one from WHO focuses specifically on vulnerability. We need to think always when we're looking at the impact of any environmental factor on a population, we need to consider how vulnerable they are. What's the vulnerability of the people in there in terms of age? particularly elderly, children, pregnant women, etc., pre-existing health status, access to resources, access to money, access to food, what makes them vulnerable from a biological uh, uh, factor and also from a social factor. And again, this takes us through how those systems interact, how all of those factors interact, vulnerability factors and access to healthcare as well, which is obviously crucial. This model, again from the Lancet from a few years ago, looking at planetary health, takes even more of a step back and looks even more distally and with a very good overview, thinking about all of these mediating factors and looking through the lens of um, technology and access to healthcare, air pollution, etc., and how these impact on health. So looking at these anthropologies 
anthropogenic changes. So again, not just looking at climate change itself, but looking at pollution, looking at loss of biodiversity and how these impact on people's health. This statement from 2015 really summarises the situation very clearly. Over the past 150 years, since the, the Industrial Revolution and the use of fossil fuels and development of technology, we have seen incredible increases and improvements in people's health. This has been accompanied by uh, reductions in infant mortality, increases in life expectancy, all of the markers that we can use to measure health in a population. However, by burning fossil fuels and by creating air pollution, climate change, water pollution, water acidification, etc., we have damaged the health of the planet. And this is really the concept of planetary health. And it's for this reason that a few years ago in nature, Rockstrom described that we've moved from the Holocene ge uh, geological period into the Anthropocene, where the influence of humans is the predominating influence. This statement says we've been mortgaging the health of future generations in order to realise economic and development gains in the present. By unsustainably exploiting nature's resources, human civilization has flourished, but now risks sub substantial health effects from the degradation of nature's life support systems in the future. So moving on now to action, what are some of the actions? So just thinking about the terminology that we use for this, when we talk about mitigation, mitigation is an intervention to reduce the sources, i.e. reduce those greenhouse gas emissions, or to enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. Enhancing the sinks tends to imply uh, reforestation of previously deforested areas is one example. Adaptation is a response to climate change that seeks to reduce that vulnerability of populations of biological systems. So when we're talking about vulnerability, we think about what's the level of exposure, how sensitive is the population to these effects. So thinking about the population within Paris during that heat wave, we can see that there was a sensitivity within those people living in Paris at that time that resulted in that increased demand for healthcare, increased um, acute effect from a heat stroke and sensitivity to that environmental factor. The adaptive capacity of a population is their ability to prepare for that and to accommodate the changes. And that's what public health systems are trying to do to make sure that populations can continue to function despite those environmental threats from extreme heat, from flooding, etc. These don't always have to be separate. For example, introducing greener areas into cities, introducing trees uh, into cities is an example of both mitigation and adaptation. So trees act as carbon sinks, they also act to improve adaptation to extreme heat by cooling down streets and providing shade. One of the reasons that the Lancet back in 2015 described climate change as the greatest global health opportunity was that they went on to describe what they have termed the health co-benefits of climate action. This is incredibly important from a, a health point of view that we consider these. There are a number of these, and I'm just going to look at two of these now. The first one is moving from a diet that is high in animal products to a diet that is low in animal products, high in plant-based food. Food production is responsible for about 25% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. It also results in air pollution, environmental pollution, and loss of biodiversity. We have what the Lancet again have described as a global syndemic of obesity, undernutrition and climate change. And all of these are linked together. We have a food system that is not working to feed the, the population of the planet. We have people who, millions of people who go hungry. And we have over 2 billion adults who are overweight. Obesity is obviously linked to a number of non-communicable diseases, including type 2 diabetes and some cancers, as well as cardiovascular diseases. 
which we're all aware is are among the leading causes of death globally. So we have a food system that is not working for the health of the population. The planetary health diet was developed by the Lancet Commission a few years ago. This diet aims to reduce the environmental impacts of food production. These are much, much higher greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution associated with livestock production compared to producing plants for consumption. It also aims to reduce the diet related diseases, including non communicable diseases and malnutrition. They've stated and concluded from this in their modeling that shifting from unhealthy diets to the planetary health diet can prevent 11 million premature adult deaths per year and drive the transition to a sustainable global food system. Another example of the health co-benefit of climate action is the adoption of active travel. Active travel essentially means using any form of transport apart from driving in a private car. So it can involve using public transport, but mainly involves walking, cycling, etc. We know that much of the population don't take anywhere near the amount of physical activity that is needed to protect their health. So low levels of physical activity are contributing to the pandemic of non-communicable diseases that we're seeing. Moving to a scenario of active travel, with increased physical activity associated with this would avert costs to the NHS, avert healthcare demand through primary and secondary disease prevention. And this paper from Woodcock et al back in 2012 aimed to calculate and estimate the amount of money that would be saved for the NHS if we adopted as a nation, if we adopted this active travel scenario. What's interesting with this is the chief saving would be the prevention of type 2 diabetes and how much money would be saved from healthcare systems if we moved to a transport system that involved much more physical activity. This obviously from a climate point of view is a win-win because this results in fewer greenhouse gas emissions, lower burning of, of fossil fuels and better air quality. So again, this is this example of a win-win scenario. All of these health and climate co-benefits are illustrated here in this slide, which I'm not going to go to into detail, but this runs through very, very clearly these linkages between tackling climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving air quality, and that impact on health and how that benefits health. One other example in here is retrofitting homes, improving insulation, how that improves health by reducing the numbers of um, deaths in cold weather, but also reducing the amount of energy that is needed to heat a home as well. And that link is very clear and has been described in detail elsewhere as well. So finally, in summary, climate change is already impacting on population health both directly through extreme weather events, such as tropical storms, hurricanes, etc., and indirectly through its effect on the social determinants of health and the economy. It will increasingly amplify existing risks, as well as creating new risks to human systems. Action on climate change through mitigation has positive impacts on population health. For example, through improvements in air quality, healthier diets and increasing physical activity. Health professionals have a key role in this by focusing on disease prevention, patient empowerment, providing lean health services, as well as through advocating for policies to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and to move to low carbon economies. 